Okay, so just so you guys have an idea of what's coming up here, um, we do have one more quiz in the first unit. That'll come up tomorrow. Quiz four is going to come up Thursday, September third. Yes. Yeah, right today. Need the volume up a little bit yet? Yeah. Good. Why? And there is one more quiz, quiz five, that will come up next week, probably Wednesday. What's that end up being? September 9th. And the reason I'm bringing all that up is because we do end, we are going to come to an end of unit one here soon. Um, if everything stays on schedule here, unit one will end and we will have the test on unit one on Thursday, September 10th. So that'd be one week from tomorrow will be our unit one test. What we'll do with that is we'll, on Wednesday on class, I will remind you of that. I will still be logged into the system that Thursday, but you will have the class time to work on the test. Um, Thursday is our login from home time anyway. Uh, so if, if you guys don't log in for class, I won't hold it against you as long as that test is done. But we'll discuss that again. We'll, we'll discuss that up next week when we get closer to the time. But just wanted you to see the schedule coming up and see that we are approaching the end of unit one. Um, those of you that do not have quizzes one, two, and three in the grade book yet, uh, because I have not received them, so make sure you, you get that done. I'm a little lenient here in the first couple of weeks, but pretty soon they're going to get cut off and you won't be able to make those up. Okay, so we've been talking about operations with decimals, and we did some stuff yesterday actually with tool sizes and fractions. Um, what I want to do today is I want to kind of tie the two together, the fractions and decimals. Does anybody have any questions off homework that we had from, I guess it would have been back on Monday. We didn't have homework yesterday. Okay, so... We had mentioned that a decimal, like point zero six seven five, that is a um, simply a fraction. It's a shortcut way for learning a fraction. That the place values of our decimals are actually fractions. We have one tenth, one one hundredth, one thousand, and the one ten thousandth digit here. And the, the actual denominator of the fraction that that decimal stands for is its place value. So this here, the denominator of the fraction that this decimal stands for, would have a denominator of 10,000 because that's the place value of its last digit. So then the rest of that fraction is 375 those decimal places just become the numerator. And it's really that simple to convert a decimal back into a fraction. Now, we're not going to keep it like that because that can be reduced. Both 375 and 10,000 can be divided by a lot of things. I mean, we notice very quickly they can both be divided by 5. But if we look closer, we can see they, might, they can both be divided by 25. 375 divided by 25 is 15. And 10,000 divided by 25 is 400. Are we done? No, both of those can still be divided by Fifteen. Fifteen divided by five would be three. Divided by five would be eighty. And that's as far as it goes. Three is a prime number. It can't be divided by anything. So that is a relatively prime um, 
numerator and denominator, so that is it. 3 80ths is the reduction of that decimal to a fraction. If we had a whole number, well, let's do 12.728. This is the whole, the part in front of the decimal is the whole number portion of a mixed number in a fraction. It's a 12. The 728 then is the numerator. Hence, hundreds, thousandths is the denominator. A little double check you can use. There's one, two, three place values, decimal places. There should be one, two, three zeros in our denominator. Now, of course, that 728 over 1,000 can still be reduced. Both of those can be divided by... Well, they're both even. Let's divide by 2. 728 divided by 2 is 364. 1,000 divided by 2 is 500. Are we done? Oh. No, they can both be divided by no. 2 again. 364 divided by 2 is 182. 500 divided by 2 is 250. And of course, they can still be divided by 2. 180 divided by 2 is 91, and 250 divided by 2 is 125. Now, there is nothing that both, the only thing that 125 can be divided by is 25. Is there a question? Oops, sorry, the echo is still giving me a little bit of a feedback here. Now, we do have to remember, we still have that one over there. That is 12 and 91, 125. Any questions? Okay, so if we want to go the other direction, if I want to turn a fraction back into a decimal. So let's start with one that we already know, 3 fourths. Most of us know that that's going to be 0.75. But if we didn't know that, how would we make it into a decimal? Well, we know that Fraction and a division problem are interchangeable. They're related. Three fourths as a fraction can be turned into three divided by four. Well, in that form of division problem, it's not very useful. But we can do it in a long division problem, three divided by four. Now, of course, four will not go into three. So there's a couple of things we have to do. First, we have to leave it blank above the three. And then we have to add the decimal point and bring that decimal point up. Now remember, when we're dividing, we can add zeros after the decimal point in the number that we are dividing. So I can put a zero in here. Four goes into three now seven times. Seven times four is 28. Now we subtract. 30 minus 28 is two. And we can add another zero and bring it down. Four goes into 20, five times. Five times four is 20, so that's done. That's our 0.75 or 0 0.75. Well, let's look at something a little bit trickier. Let's look at five over 80. Let's have some fun. Oh, well, that one's not. That would reduce to 1 16th. So let's do 3 16th. That one's going to be a little trickier. So it's 3 divided by 16. Now again, 16 does not go into 3, so we add the decimal point and bring it up, making sure we either leave it blank above the 3 or we can put a 0 above the 3, either one. And now we add the 0 here after the 3, after the decimal point. Now, 16 goes into 30 once. 1 times 16 is 16. We subtract. 30 minus 16 gives us 14. And we add the 0 and bring it down. 16 goes into 140, I'd say. Oh, what is it? 8 times? Looks right to me. 8 times 16. 8 times 6 is 48. So 8 carry the 4. 8 times 1 is 8, plus 4 is 12, 128. 
and we subtract, we get 12 left over. Now, what we get left over here always has to be smaller than what we're dividing by. Make sure of that. So we can keep adding zeros. We'll add another zero and bring it down. 16 into 120. That looks like it's going to go seven times. Seven times 16. Well, seven times six is 42, so two carry the four. Seven times four is seven plus four is 11. That's 112. We subtract to get eight. So I'll add one more zero and bring it down. 16 goes into 80 exactly five times. Five times 16 is 80. So that zero is out. There's nothing left. So there it is. Thir three sixteenths is 0.1875. Now, luckily, we have this wonderful tool in the calculator. <clears throat> where if we're asked to turn a fraction to a decimal, we can just divide it out. We don't have to do all of that. But as I've mentioned before, there are times where the calculator just isn't present and you're going to need to be able to do at least an approximate calculation of those. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, years ago, the mechanical design students, we used to force them to memorize down to the 16th for the decimal equivalents. Okay, our next step. We want to talk some more about power. We've seen them a little bit more in operations. Put them briefly. We all know that this is 8 to the power of 3 or 8 cubed or 8 to the third. What it stands for, of course, is 8 times 8 times 8. 3 eighths multiplied by 7. If you cut it out, we get 512. Um, a couple of things here. In an exponent, there are actually two forms of an exponent. One is this form here, the power form. There are always two pieces. We have the base. In this case, that's the 8. That's the number that is getting operated on. And we have the power. In this case, that's the 3. Telling us how many times we're repeating the 8. Okay, so... Here for this one, 8 to the third power, it's not so bad to punch that in the calculator as 8 times 8 times 8. But if I give you 2 to the power of 11, that's going to be a rough one. Trying to do 2 times 2 times 2, trying to remember, is that 10 times or is that 11 twos that I've entered? There would be a lot of mistakes made. So we need a way to enter that directly. Depending on your calculator, if you have the Texas Instruments, most Texas Instruments calculators have that button called the carrot key. Your Casios and Sharps typically have either an X to the Y key or X with a, a blank box up there. Or some of them, it's a box with another little box. It's the power key. All four of those keys, no matter what form you have, work the same way. Press whichever key you have for the power and then enter the 11. Let's the power of 11. If you try to enter that in your calculator, you should get 2048. If you have your calculator with you, um, please try to enter that and make sure you come up with 2048 so we know you can operate your calculator correctly for those. Anybody not get it to work? So, our next step then is a root. We have these powers. Every operation in math has what we call an inverse. Inverses are pairs of operations that work together. We mentioned one is forward, one is backwards and reverse. And we mentioned addition and subtraction.
um, for addition and subtraction. If I pick a number like eight and I add five to it, I'm gonna get 13. Well, if I wanna get back to that five, I take my 13, or sorry, I wanna get back to that eight that I started with, I take my 13 and I subtract five and I'm back to eight. Adding five and subtracting five canceled each other out. We ended up back where we started. And it doesn't matter which one we do first. If I start with eight, I could have subtracted five and got three. If I wanna get back to that eight, I take the three and add five and I'm back at eight. Again, subtracting five and adding five cancel each other out, no matter which one comes first. We have the same relationship between multiplication and division. We start out with a 12 and let's multiply by three. Well, that would be 36. If I wanna get back to that 12, I would take my 36 and divide by three. Puts me at 12. Multiplying by three and dividing by three cancel each other out. Or I could go the other way. I could start with the 12 and divide by three to get four. To get back to that 12, I would take my four and multiply by three get back to the 12. Again, dividing by three and multiplying by three cancel each other out no matter what order they're in. So these powers they have an inverse operation. Their inverse operation is a root. Now we've all seen that symbol before. The square root. Because that's most most often what it's doing when we see it. It's technically called the radical symbol. And it actually means, you know, in this case, it means a square root when there's nothing else with it. But it can mean other types of roots if it has an index. First of all, the definition of a square root. If I ask you for the square root of 49, what that is asking is what number squared equals 49? Well, most of us know that 7 squared equals 49, so the square root of 49 equals 7. Well, we've talked about integers enough, I should mention this. 7 squared equals 49, but negative 7 squared also equals 49. So technically, the square root of 49 is 7 or negative 7. There's two possible answers for that. Now, for most of what we do, we're looking for the positive answer. So the positive seven would be what we would want, but we have to be aware that there is a second possible answer there. Well, let's. what if we had though that eight to the power of three that we were talking about earlier? We wanna reverse that. Well, what we would use is a third root. We know that eight to the power of three was 512. So reversing that, the third root of 512 should take us back to eight. These roots have two parts, just like the powers did. This is our base here. That's the number we're operating on. And this now is not called a power, but it's called an index. It indicates what power is being reversed or inverted here. Now, with our negatives, we got to be a little careful. You know, we said that negative 7 squared equals 49. But if I enter that in my calculator, now there's two ways to do it in the calculator. I'm just going to do 7 squared here first. 7, I could use the power key and then put it into 2 for squared. That's my power key right there. That's my caret key. Or, there's a short key because the squared happens so often. They have a special key there to save you a keystroke that's just an x squared key. Either way, it works. It gives us the 49 or 7 squared. However, if we want to do negative 7 squared, most of your keys, most of your calculators, by the way, have a separate key for negative. There's a few of them that let you use the subtraction key, but most of them, you have a different key that looks something like that. It's a minus with the parentheses around it. If I do negative 7, and I do the squared, it tells me that's negative 49. But I know that negative seven squared is negative seven 
times negative 7. And we know a negative times a negative is a positive. That has to be a positive 49. Well, what the calculator is doing here is a strict order of operations. It's taking the positive first, and it's applying the negative, which is what it should do. So in order to square a negative number, we have to enter it in parentheses like that. Negative 7 in parentheses, and then the x squared outside the parentheses, and it'll give us the correct answer. So when we have a negative number and we're taking it to a power, we have to be careful to make sure we use those parentheses. So let's do negative 5 squared. Well, negative 5 squared is negative 5 times negative 5, which is a positive 25. What if I do negative 5 to the third power? Negative 5 times negative 5 times another negative 5. Well, we know that the first two combine to be 25. Multiply that by another negative 5, that's a negative 125. Positive times a negative is a negative. 25 times 5 is 125. What if we had negative 5 to the power of 4? Well, that's going to be 4 of those negative 5s. Negative 5. Multiplied together. Well, we already know that those first three, the first, first three, multiply to make negative 125. We saw that up there. Negative 125 times another negative 5. Well, negative times a negative is a positive. 125 times 5 is 625. Let's do one more and see if we can find a pattern here. Negative 5 to the power of 5. Of course, that's going to be 5 of those negative 5 multiplied together. We know that the first four is 625. We multiply by another one. That's going to become negative. Negative is a negative. 3,125. Well, there's a pattern developing here. You can see that some of the answers are positive. Those positive answers are from the, the exponents that have an even power. Two, four. Others are negative. Those are from the exponents that had an odd power. When we are dealing with powers, negative number. Of course, if the number is positive, the power is going to be positive all the time. But if we're starting with a negative number, if the power is even, the result is going to be positive, always. The power is odd, the result will be negative, always. Now, with that in mind, it affects our inverse here. If I want to do well, if I try to enter that in my calculator, the square root, negative 25, my calculator is going to say bad things to me here. This is non-real number, non-real answer. It's an error. Why? Well, remember, that square root symbol is asking us what number squared equals negative 25. Well, a positive 5 squared equals 20, positive 25. But a negative 5 squared also equals a positive 25. Because whenever we have that even power, we always get a positive answer. So there is no number we can put in there that if we square it, we get a negative number. This has no solution. We cannot take the square root of a negative number. Now, I say that here for this course, that's the way we're going to hold up, is you can't take the square root of a negative number. If any of you were to go on for a four-year degree, um, taking a college algebra course, or even an intermediate algebra course, um, you would run into what they call imaginary and complex numbers. And what they did 
was they took this idea that you cannot take the square root of a negative number and they made up an answer for it. They made up a way that you can do it and then they built a whole other piece of algebra around it. Um, in practical applications, I only know of a couple. Mo they basically deal with uh, electronics and circuitry where you have a capacitive and inductive circuits um, dealing with your phasers and stuff like that. You have Sometimes you have a imaginary impedance or a complex impedance or resistance. In construction, I, there's really nothing. If you end up with an imaginary number or the square root of a negative, you've done something wrong or there's been a structural failure. So we might have the third root of a negative 125. Well, we just saw here that negative 5 to the third power is a negative 125. So that just very simply becomes negative 5. That's the definition of that third root, is reversing the third power. If I want to do a fourth root of a negative 625, well, again, that that's asking what number to the fourth power equals a negative 625. Well, anything, the four is an even power. Anything to an even power is positive. So there is nothing we can put in there. That's going to have no solution. Now, how do you do a fourth root on your calculator? Most of you have different keys. Um, you might have a x root key or an n root key or it might simply have a box in a root and it's typically not on the main key it's what we call a second function it's up above the key like for mine uh, on most ti texas instruments i should say not on my calculator on screen here but most texas instruments above the caret key you see that x root key so to access that you either have to use the second key or the shift key and the way you would enter that, you would do four, then second or shift, depending on which key you have. And then that X root key, whichever one you have, and then you would enter, let's just do positive 625 so it works out. That would give you five. The fourth root of 625 is five. If you did the fourth root of a negative 625, however, it would give you an error again. No solution. If we did the fifth of a negative 3125, well, we just saw negative 5 to the power of 5 is negative 3125. So that is simply a negative 5. So because of this pattern here, that an even power always gives a positive answer, we cannot do. For roots, for an even root, not be negative. We cannot do the even root of a negative. For an odd root, we can, but for an even, we cannot, because there's nothing to an even power that will give us a negative answer. Um, let's take a look at something like this. We're going to combine our decimals, our powers, and our roots into our order of operations now. In this problem here, we see this line across here is a fraction bar. It is telling us to divide, but it's also an enclosing symbol, telling us we have to do everything on top and then everything on bottom separately and then combine them with division. So on top, I'm going to write that over here. 18.54 plus parentheses 12 times 0.04. Oops, not 0 0.04, just 0.4. And then squared. So the first thing I have to do is the parentheses. 12 times 0.4 is 4.8. Now I can take out the parentheses because there's a single number inside of them. I do have to make sure that squared goes on the 4.8. 
Now I have 4.8 squared, which is, what is that, 23.04, I believe. And 18.54 plus 23.04 gives me 41.58. So the top of this fraction here is 41.58. Now we'll have to do the bottom of the fraction. Well, I've got the square root here. There's an exponent. Square root of 2.25 is 1.5. Then we have the 68 times 0 0.08. Give me a 5.44. 5.44 minus 1.5 is 3.94. So the bottom is 3.94. So what we have here is 19.6 plus 41.58 over 3.94. Now there's nothing else that has to be done first, so we're going to do that division. 41.58 divided by 3.94. Give me a 10.5533. So how did I know where to round? Well, let's say that we are told to round our answer to the nearest hundredth. We well, might say, well, I went way past the hundredth here. Yes, the final answer is going to be rounded to the nearest hundredth. But when you're working, you should always go two places past what your answer is going to be. So if my answer is going to be rounded to the hundredth or two decimal places, I should keep four decimal places in my work. That's why I rounded it off to 0.5533 there. And now I can add 19.6 plus 10.5533 is 30.1533. Now I can round my, as my final answer, I can round to the nearest hundredth. That's 30.15. So the key, when you're asked to round to a specific decimal place, don't round to that decimal place until you get to the final answer. If you round at every step to that place, that round off error can build up and you can be off by a couple of hundreds or thousands, depending on what you're rounding to in your final answer. Always go two decimal places past what your final answer is going to get rounded to. Okay, so for how many Jesus Christ. There's some major feedback problems here today. I'm not sure what's going on. I'll have them look into that for tomorrow, hopefully. In the little book, it's unit 15. In the big book. I'm going to have you do page 143, exercise 3-16A, 1 through 39, the odds. Also page 145, exercise 3-16B, 1 through 31, the odds. And the last piece will be page, where are we here? 153, 154, exercise 3-19, 1 through 37, the odds. Now again, as always, if you're feeling comfortable with those, feel free to skip over some of the easier ones up to the more difficult ones. Also make sure, this point you have completed quizzes one, two, and three need to be completed. Do we have any questions? Okay, so I am supposed to try to give you at least 10 or 15 minutes worth of work time, so I'm going to cut off the recording here.